Well, thank you. Um, as has been said, the topic of my paper is the intrinsic providence of being, the relationship of image and likeness to being and knowing in the book of Genesis. Image and likeness. These terms emerge from the book of Genesis, wed in an anthropology so exalted and so bright that some sadly opt to turn away. Quote, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. End quote. From the start, the nature of this pairing has challenged the interpretive faculty of readers, and no less so in the patristic era. Before treating that, however, two more terms should be introduced, also paired in Scripture, though more implicitly. They are being and knowing, and their pas de deux is a wonder well worth our attention. It will be the purpose of this presentation to demonstrate that this is so, and further to propose that being and knowing are not only related to image and likeness, but may be key in illuminating them. Lastly, I'll attempt to identify some concrete pastoral implications such a vision bears in shaping the evangelization of a culture suffering more and more in its widening estrangement from the biblical understanding of human origins. So, as mentioned, uh, patristic commentators were intrigued by image and likeness, and they puzzled over why the Genesis narrative, the Genesis narrative presents two terms that at first glance seem so similar. What they asked might the difference be, and of what significance. So we begin with image. Of the various possibilities for interpreting the Hebrew term, I call attention to one in particular, a representative figure. It seems to have made sense to the translators of the Septuagint, who rendered it in Greek as icona, recognizable to English speakers by its cognate icon. This term originates in uh, ico, to, to be like, but if image were mere likeness, this would seem to return us to the question of why two terms in the first place. However, in this case, the elasticity of the Greek allows it to stretch without infidelity to mean a mirror-like representation that reflects its source exactly. It's in this latter sense that Christ is called the image or icon of God, and of course this use of image to describe the person of Christ is not what is is not what the theological tradition ascribes to humans, where the, the, the image, though close, is by no means exact. We shouldn't be surprised, then, to find that among the patristic reflections on this, the view that image is an ontological category. Indeed, the very term homoousius, or consubstantial, that was utilized at the Council of Nicaea, uh, would soon be used by St. John Chrysostom to describe the relationship of Adam and Eve and consequently the ontological unity and equality of all humans. This is not to say that the ontological interpretation was held unanimously or that it rose to the status of a dogma, but neither was it condemned or held in suspicion for that matter. And in my view, it has a decidedly resonant appeal. Moreover, in the conventional configuration of Genesis 1.26, the primacy of place held by image indicates perhaps a significance beyond the aesthetic. And if we accept image in this ontological sense, a rather startling role for likeness begins to recommend itself. To prepare for a discussion of what that role might be, one more thing should be said about image or icon. In the Christian tradition, icons are called holy because of the common belief that they point to the divinity within and beyond themselves, sharing in that divinity, perhaps in the difficult-to-define way, the threshold of a door may be said to be both the threshold and yet also part of the room itself. Now, I ask you to keep this analogy of a doorway in mind because it will bear directly on the relationship of ontology to sin that we'll address when we look at the fourth chapter of Genesis. And now we move on to likeness. If one proceeds with the view that 
Two terms are deliberately employed in Genesis 1.26 precisely because they are not the same, and that image points to an ontology humans share with God, though not fully. It's difficult not to incline with the likes of St. Gregory of Nyssa toward viewing likeness as a volitional, moral, or epistemological category. In the Septuagint, the Greek likeness was translated as homoiosis, a term that so closely resembles homoousios, it may cause us to do a double take. Shades of meaning here include a sense of dynamism, a making like. In this, there is that suggestion of intentionality, of volition, and underlying it all, freedom. It was perhaps in such fertile soil that the seeds of St. Gregory's notion of epictasis, that is, the spiritual life as an ongoing striving for perfection, took root. Now, at this point, I really ought to pause and mention the fact that the patristic approaches to this, these issues were roundly uh, rejected in the 20th century by exegetes in the reform tradition, especially of the German variety. No less a figure than Karl Barth, for example, found the patristic disposition on this issue freighted with dogmatic presumptions the texts simply do not support. It's not my purpose here to go into the details of this or the counter-arguments that have found that rejection itself fatally flawed. I'll simply say I find the patristic defense decisive and, by the way, uh, elegantly summarized in Vladimir Lasky's essay, The Theology of the Image. Today, the consensus is that the story of the garden, Adam and Eve, and the fall, as laid out in Genesis 2 and 3, come to us via a tradition known as the Yahwist. This derives mainly from the use of the self-revealed name of God, Yahweh, recorded by this tradition in the book of Exodus. A detailed account of what led to this assessment is not the point here. What is important for the present consideration, however, is that it is this divinity, rendered more specifically than in the distinct tradition responsible for Genesis 1, with whom humans are engaged when we meet them prior to and after the fall, the, the before and after states, also referred to as pre- and post-lapsarian. By the third chapter of Exodus, Moses has led the people out of Egyptian bondage into the desert and has been involved in an ongoing dialogue with God on Mount Sinai. Concerned that his leadership may be challenged, Moses asks God how he should answer if the people demand to know the identity of the one with whom Moses has been speaking. The answer given him is a semantic wonder of inexhaustible depth, whose power both to disorient and edify endures undiminished to this day. Impossible to define with precision it is something of an ontological treasure map that for some Jews may never be spoken. There is pragmatism here as well as reverence, for this name, the Tetragrammaton, is effectively unutterable. To speak it is immediately and unavoidably to assign it limits. Two generally accepted renderings of this name are I am who I am, or I am who I shall be, often distilled simply to I am. All of this points to an identity rooted in an ontology that is both essential and ultimate, supra-essential, if such a term it makes sense. It might be possible, then, to assert that the original testament, that is, the Old Testament, proclaims that God is being, and the New Testament, that God is love. This is crude, of course, but not without some usefulness, for, if valid, these would seem amenable to the following tautology. God is being, God is love, therefore being is love, and love is being. In other words, reality is personal, for what is love if not personal? Still, one need not agree with this proposition to acknowledge the deeply intriguing ontological character of the divine name Yahweh. And again, it is this personage with whom humans are engaged in Genesis 2 and 3. The relationship between God, the God of Israel and the people has ever been understood as 
covenantal. In recent years, eye-opening work has been done exploring this subject, and the contribution of Walter Vogels is especially helpful in this regard. In his work, God's Universal Covenant of Biblical Study, Vogels makes the case that the traditions culminating in the creation and fall texts of Genesis are the fruit of an effort to locate a universal covenant in prehistory, one shaped by long experience in the particular covenant between God and Israel. In so doing, these traditions entered into what Vogels calls, quote, a prophecy of the past, end quote. In this prophecy, we are given the terms of the Universal Covenant and also that it was established before the fall or lapse. Indeed, it begins with the very emergence of human existence, which, unlike any other creature in the story, is breathed into being with God's own breath. Thus, salvation history can be said to begin not with the Jewish people, but with people. It is therefore a universal grace, truly Catholic in scope. Given what I presented so far, might we therefore call this incipient relationship an ontological covenant? Can we be true to the text and at the same time identify something we might profitably call the intrinsic providence of being? Walter Bruegemann has said that the purpose of the creation story found in Genesis is, quote, concretely existential, end quote. And this feels almost self-evidently true. But he's also drawn attention to what he calls an imaginative tradition of interpreting these texts that's led to some troubling conclusions. The chronological primacy of Adam in the story, for example, has been used as a scriptural warrant for a view of male superiority over the female. We've already alluded to the exegesis of John Chrysostom on this point, with its rejection of such a claim on ontological grounds. However, there is perhaps something more here. Genesis 2.22, which describes the origin of Eve, is a case in point. Quote, And the rib that Yahweh God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. End quote. More than a few feminist theologians have argued that, rather than pointing to female subordination, the term rib can and should be translated as side thus providing seminal affirmation of gender equality. Verna Harrison goes further, suggesting there is perhaps an even deeper stratum in the story. Joining those who opt for this reading of side rather than rib, she proposes that what is being presented here is not foremost a treatment of gender, but in fact a more radical, existential, and universal view of two sides of a human being. Whether or not I'm extending Harrison's point beyond what she would approve, such a hypothesis is sure to draw the objection that it is yet another instance of imposing on the text modern notions not originally intended. But as in the case of those who gave us these texts, can we not also discern a call to enter into a prophecy of the past? Reading them in the eschatological light of the resurrection as Wolfhard Pannenberg insists we can only truly understand history, might we not discover things ever ancient and ever new while avoiding the vulgarity of an anachronistic imposition? One way to bring the relationship of image and likeness into sharper relief is through an analysis of its refraction. To this end, let's look at two examples in Genesis starting with the later episode found in chapter 4. This is the story of Cain, who is experiencing mounting agitation in his perception of God's preference for his brother Abel. God addresses Cain on the matter, quote, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. End quote. There's a great deal going on here, but I'd like to focus on a few elements pertinent to our discussion so far. It is here, in this text, that the term sin first appears in the Bible. Not even in the episode of Adam and Eve in the garden is it referred to 
by the text that way, though, of course, there has clearly been an act that distorts both image and likeness, one that has been memorialized as the original sin. Over time, there have been many ways of speaking or about or defining sin, but Thomas Merton added one that seems especially meaningful in the present context, calling it, quote, an ontological lapse. How intriguing, then, is the use of the term door in God's words to Cain? Now remember, in our treatment of icons, I proposed the threshold of a door, with its difficult-to-divine character of being both a threshold yet part of the room itself, as analogous to the Christian understanding of the image or icon. It's curious, too, that sin is described as lurking at the door. It could be the case that sin is lurking just outside the door, but would it transgress the sense and proportion of the text to wonder if the door here might on some level be serving metaphorically as the portal through which one may step out, out of the immediacy of the ontological image, through a volitional act that originates in the epistemological freedom of likeness. As the story goes, Cain steps through that door in an act of murder and proceeds to dwell in the land of Nod, that is, the land of wandering. It may occur to us that this wandering speaks also metaphorically of a mode of continued self-distancing from image. Yet despite Cain's worst fears, God marks him, thereby protecting him from the punishment he's right to expect, but which is more than God is willing to allow. This leads to the perennial enigma. Why sin? Why step out of the beauty of image? And what's more, exercising the faculty of likeness to do so. God exhorts Cain to master what is lurking and desirous for him. What could possibly be the appeal of ignoring such an exhortation? It is to Genesis 3 that we should return now in a search for some clues. Uh, I confess that such descriptions of the fall as a rebellion against God or a preference for evil over good or a desire to be God have never really made much sense to me. St. Paul, who is so painfully honest about the syndrome of sin in his own life, doesn't resort to such depictions. In fact, he gets no more ambitious than simply to cry out at the vexing puzzle and pattern of it. <clears throat> the material of Genesis 3 is so rich and so profound, it would be preposterous to attempt but the briefest of observations in such a limited format as this presentation. In the Sundering Eden event, the focus is on what is forbidden to Adam and Eve, namely to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All else is theirs, including stewardship of the created order. One of the first things that suggests itself in the symbol of this tree is the specter of dualism that it bears. It is this dualism that is set in motion in human perception at the moment of ingestion, and in a sense becomes historically incarnate. This perception, which is again a function of likeness to God, is now distorted, such that the epistemological faculty is compromised, subject now to the illusions of a dualism that is wholly alien to God's own mode of being. The operative definition of dualism to which I refer may be described as the perception of self existing apart from all that is not self. In the mortal world, this puts self in an, in an unending competition to survive, physically and psychically, with all that is not self, with all that is other. We might say that in this state, the only thing that is beyond any possible doubt is one's own existence, that is, I am. Now let's recall that the God with whom Adam and Eve are engaged is Yahweh. I am. The image remains, even after the fall, but the perception of it is now disfigured. What was once beatitude is now burden. What was once natural is now nakedness to be hidden from God and each other. It may sound a little strange, but in a sense, what we have here are competing 
I am's. One of the major contributions of Buddhism to the world can be found in the first and second of its four noble truths. One, all contingent being is suffering. Two, the cause of all suffering is the desire for permanence. Implicit in this insight is the role of mortality. The dread of mortality, even if unacknowledged, alarms and consequently reifies and objectifies the self. However, as the story of the fall has been handed down, its accumulated pseudo-details, elements that may be implied by, but certainly are not, in the text. Among them is the notion that death, physical death, is the direct result of original sin. The presumption is that prior to the lapse, the human was immune from mortality. But nowhere does the text say that. In fact, in Genesis 3.22, which is after the fall, God reflects to himself, quote, And now the human might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and therefore live forever. End quote. This may impress some as rather scandalously petty uh, on God's part, but I submit it actually demonstrates the opposite. That is, for God to allow humanity to eat from the tree of life at this point would be to sanction a life lived eternally, eternally in that condition of distorted image and likeness, which in Buddhist terms is suffering. The larger point is, to live is to be subject to mortality. That was, tr that was as true for Adam and Eve as it is for us. In our likeness resides the epistemological freedom to make judgments in the face of that mortality. In other words, God most emphatically did not create sin, but did create the conditions in which sin is a possibility. There is in the temptation story a strong flavor of existential crisis. It's remarkable that in this critical moment God is suddenly absent and returns only after the lapse has occurred. It seems hardly coincidental that, in common human experience, moral default often occurs in such moments of sensed absence, resulting in, a, in an array of self-serving and destructive choices. This may seem rather fateful, yet if the universal covenant is upheld in the intrinsic providence of being, that is love, then salvation is ever present. And here, Gregory of Nyssa's notion of epictasis is critical. For Gregory and the Eastern Church in general, the doctrine of theosis is central. This formula, attributed to St. Athanasius, confesses, quote, God became human so that humans might become God, end quote. In this, likeness is purified and restored to right relationship with image. It is a process that takes place not in some realm of platonic idealism, but in an ascetical struggle conformed to the paschal mystery of Christ himself and exercised within the full liturgical life of the ecclesial community, that is, the body of Christ. For Christians, to participate in the image of God is to participate in the image of Christ, that is, to think with the mind of, God, of Christ, to love with the heart of Christ, to know as Christ knows. Here at last, it, the relationship of being and knowing comes into view. For to know apart from being is not truly to know, but merely to think and to reason. To know in the full sense is to experience being known. The hyphenation here is deliberate. It points to an experience of being love, so profound that the I am of distorted likeness is displaced, yielding in joy to image, to the I am of God's being. The long-born burden is relieved in the revelation that ultimately there is no self but God, St. Paul seems to alight on this, and richly, quote, Now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, end quote. And in the same letter to the Galatians, quote, 
It is no longer I, but Christ in me who lives. End quote. Finally, we might push things and even imagine God saying, quote, When my mind becomes your mind, you will not merely have a mind, but a way of being that is loving. What I've been saying so far is an obviously forensic and clumsy way of broaching something that's ineffably beautiful. In the contemporary world, at least its Western Hemisphere, this beauty has become less and less accessible. Those commissioned to share the gospel face a steep challenge, and yet anti-theistic alternatives have proven destitute, or worse, impotent in their very fundaments. In the real world, they tear down where the gospel builds. They atomize where the gospel unifies, and they degrade where the gospel exalts. In terms of evangelization, indeed in terms of pastoral concerns generally, a moral vision formed and illuminated by an image and likeness is concrete and positive, capable of communicating the Orthodox Christian kerygma to an audience less and less familiar with the conventional terminology of that kerygma. Further, notions such as the intrinsic providence of being have the potential to move us from the dualisms that make the imminence and transcendence of God seem like an either-or predicament, locating illusions of first-person subjectivity while supporting a Christian anthropology in which genuine personhood is rooted in the mind and heart of Christ, the image of the unseen God, through whose shared humanity we exercise our own divinity. The witness that God became human so that humans can become God is startling in the dignity it ascribes to humanity. It is that vision which awaits us in the book of Genesis. In a culture where transcendence is denied and life deemed disposable, such dignity stands as a singular and hopeful brightness. Indeed, the very worst that may be said of it is that it's just too good to be true. And to that, we ought, with the psalmist, respond, taste and see. Thank you.